Cool. Awesome. So hello, everyone. Thanks for joining my talk, Unbreaking Production Bugs with Non-Breaking Breakpoints. My name is Brandon Ferguson. I'm a software developer by trade, and I have a lot of interest in what the future of software development might look like. I think it'll be more automated like everything else. And I think, and I like thinking about and working on that type of technology. So if that stuff interests you, go ahead, feel free to reach out. Anyways, most recently, my interests have led me to creating a project known as Source Marker and another called Source Plus Plus, both of which are built on Apache Skywalking, uh, one of which was released as open source yesterday, but more on all that later. Um, so before we discuss non-breaking breakpoints, I'd like to ask, how do you typically locate bugs in production environments? I mean, what makes a production bug any different than a bug found in any other environment? Let's take a look at some typical software development environments. You've got your local environment, your staging environment, and your production environment. For a given software product, these environments are going to look, exact, look essentially the same, but there will be some key differences between them. The most obvious being, of course, uh, the audience that environments are built for. Local is just for your devs. Staging is for the devs and QA, and maybe some stakeholders. Then finally, production, which is, and then finally production, which is for the the broader public users. One thing that becomes obvious as you go from local to production is that each environment is geared for geared for a greater amount of external access than the previous. Local is just for just for you. Staging is for a few more people, and then production is geared for the maximum amount of people. At the same time, though, the inverse is also true. As a developer, when I'm working locally, I have full access to the internal state of whatever software I'm working on. So if a bug were to appear, it's not hard to see why it's feasible those bugs can be solved with relative ease. And if we continue with this pattern, that would put staging at a medium level of internal access. We can still find bugs in staging, but it's not as easy as if we had full internal access. So if we had things like um, logging and stuff like that turned all the way up, we could get much easier um, access, much more internal access. Logically, this leads to the crux of the difficulty in locating production bug, locating bugs in production environments. They're simply not geared for it. Production environments sacrifice internal access for maximum external access. They are built so that everyone can use production, but very few actually have the keys to the server to see how things are really working. So with that being the case, what's a developer to do? How do we locate bugs in production environments? Well, we always could try a blind search. It's not the most intelligent approach given its brute force nature, but it does at least give us one method for locating bugs in an environment like production, an environment built with minimal internal access. There's just one step to the blind search approach, and that's a generate and test. Generate and test different configurations until you happen by the one that correlates to a given bug report. So starting with our bug report, our goal is to find the internal configuration that would reproduce that bug. Okay, so let's do that then and generate and test some uh, generate and test some internal generate and test some internal configurations and see if we can reproduce it. So we generate a first one. Nope, turns out the first one we generate doesn't cause the bug. So let's generate and test some more. None of those reproduce the bug either. So we just keep generating and testing again and again per the blind search approach, searching through all the full universe of configurations we can through our local environment until we happen by the one that eventually. Uh, causes the bug that we see in production. So the blind search isn't very exciting, but it is. it can be effective. And that's because it's repeatable. You get to try over and over again, which of course can be both a bad and good thing. Good because we can inch our way towards a bug, but bad because we have to inch our way towards a bug. Thankfully, blind searching isn't the best we can do. We could always try a more sophisticated or informed heuristic search of some kind. So this approach has a few more steps. But in many to most cases, it's going to be far superior to your blind search. The reason why is because contrary to blind searching, which relies on generating and testing to locate bugs, the heuristic approach involves recording and replaying to locate bugs. So but for the strategy to work, we need an idea of where we where and what sorry for this strategy to work. We need an idea for where and what we want to record. And this is the first step of the heuristic approach, locating points of interest within the software source code. Let's say we open our IDE, and let's say we think that this top, let's say we think the top half of this source code is a point of interest. So now what? Next, we need to expose the application state at those points of interest. In our case, let's use some logging code, since this is the most widely, mean, widely used means by which the state of production software is exposed. In fact, exposing the internal state of software is actually the point of logging. If our logging code didn't do that, it would be fundamentally useless. Once we've added our logging code, the next step, the next step is to save the application state. Okay, so this involves 
deploying our code to production. And then finally, waiting for our logs to be triggered in production and then saved to storage. So let's wait for our logs to accumulate as this bug occurs in production. So people are using our services, the logs are accumulating, the bugs are happening. And as the logs accumulate, even though our production environment has a low internal access, so we can't see it, we're, ne we're nevertheless able to save pieces of the internal state to storage. Not a complete picture, since all of our code, since some of our code is unlogged and therefore didn't expose some data that would have been useful for um, exposing the full internal state, but that's okay, we can continue to the next step, which is of course, reconstructing the application state. So with logs, this means downloading potentially gigabytes or however many, uh, however much logs you have, and then searching for and then reading through all the, the all the all the logs to find the necessary exposed data that would help you pinpoint this um, issue in production. And then with enough effort, we could get a picture of the internal state of production to a pretty reasonable degree. We can't exactly see we can't see exactly where the bug is, but uh, with the logs, we're able to pinpoint it to a degree where there's not many places it could be. Of course, if we could log everything all the time, we could get a perfect picture of the internal state of production. This is obviously not possible, however, for many reasons, primarily being how inefficiently software would run if we recorded everything it did. So in reality, we're always having a somewhat incomplete picture of production. And this is the weakness of the heuristic approach. Since we can't always know where bugs will appear, we can't always know how to preemptively expose them. We can't always write logs and et cetera to, to show us that a bug did happen. Eventually, we're going to run into bugs which, haven't which we haven't adequately exposed. And so the heuristic approach has no solution for this, but on failure, go back to doing the blind searching again. This is because there is no loop between the changing, uh, there, is, there isn't a continuous loop between changing logged and unlogged code in production. It's not something that's updated continuously. There can and, and often is a very long and drawn out process involved in getting code changes of any type into production. So in lieu of updating production, Developers will often just pick up where the heuristic search left off by doing blind searches on their local system where they have full internal access. However, this time we've got something a little bit better than just a bug report. We've got concrete data on bug on a bug and we can use that to guide us. So now we don't have just a description of a bug, but we have actual concrete data that we can use to find the bug. So with that information, we can avoid searching the whole universe of possible configurations. See, now instead of searching all possible local configurations, we can see from what we were able to expose of the bug that there's no possible way that it could be certain configurations and so we can rule them out. Here I've ruled, all the, ruled out all the configurations on the left because we can see that the internal state kind of looks like cogs pointed to the right. And just like, and just like that, we've kind of, we've half the search, we've half the search space. If we compare the blind searching to heuristic searching, you can kind of see why logging in production is so important. So, but while heuristic searching does narrow down the search space, there can still be local configurations developers need to iterate before locating production bugs. So can we do better than this? Can we just debug production in production and avoid all this extra work, all this extra local reproduction? With non-breaking breakpoints, the answer is yes. And that's because they allow for blind heuristic searching. With non-breaking breakpoints, there is no need to reproduce and locate production bugs locally because you can capture them as they, incur, as they occur in production. Okay, then, so how does this all work? Well, blind heuristic searching is just like heuristic searching, but with one key difference. And that's the third step of the heuristic search approach, where you fail to collect enough data to locate a production bug, and now your options are to redeploy to product production or to find the bug via blind searching locally. Instead, the blind heuristic approach says, no, just go ahead and repeat the steps as you did before. And that's because the blind heuristic search, and that's because blind heuristic searching is just repeatable heuristic searching. So let's repeat the steps we did the first time around. And instead of this time, let's choose a point of interest that's in the unlogged code, because it's not gonna be something in the log code that we, we, we want more information on. We want something that was unlogged. And this time, instead of using logging code to expose and save the, the internal state of production, we're gonna use non-breaking breakpoints. So non-breaking breakpoints work exactly like regular breakpoints. So there's, no, so there's no need to redeploy code or change code. They take effect instantly when we instantly, and we can place them where we want to. They don't halt, break, or interrupt the, 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 the program's execution. So placing them in production is relatively, um, um, has negligible overhead. And the customers that are in these transactions will not feel that effect. They won't uh, have to, pause their transaction to, um, for this breakpoint to take, take place. 
Okay, so with our non-breaking breakpoint instantly sent to production, our next step is to collect the application state. So we're gonna need to, so we're going to need that non-breaking breakpoint to actually trigger in production. So let's wait a bit for someone to use our code in production. And like the, and just like that, we seem to have enough information to locate this bug happening in production. So let's download that data. And then with that, we have a complete picture of the internal state of production, the moment the bug occurred. We now know where the production bug is, and, and we've done it in a way which didn't require any local blind searching. We didn't actually write any code locally. We didn't run any code locally. If our first non-breaking breakpoint didn't work, we could have easily just kept adding more and more until we found what we were looking for. And what that allows us to do is to, instead of inching our way towards reproducing production bugs, we can force production bugs to expose themselves. Now we can strategically set breakpoints in production and corner bugs. We can work backwards. No brute force necessary. A nice side effect of this approach is that we no longer have to worry about false positives since we're no longer reproducing bugs outside of production. Bugs you find with non-breaking breakpoints cannot not be in production because you found them in production. So you never have to worry about, is this fix I created going to work in production? It's because the bug you found for that fix was from production. Simply put, non-breaking breakpoints make live debugging possible. Now, I personally found these ideas really interesting, so I thought, how could one go about actually creating something like this? Well, one quickly realizes that they've essentially got two basic problems to solve. We need a way of communicating from a developer's IDE that some live code needs to be instrumented in production. And we need a way of streaming back immediate feedback to that developer. Once we have those two pieces in place, we can continuously loop them and enable live debugging abilities like non-breaking breakpoints. So I figured I'd try to tackle this challenge by first starting with the immediate feedback problem. In last ApacheCon, I presented SourceMarker, a continuous feedback framework designed to solve that problem. Conceptually, SourceMarker is very, very simple. Let's say, we, let's say that unknowingly, unknowingly to us, we're about to deploy some um, bug to production. So we start with our IDE. Unknowingly to us, we write our code, and this eventually gets um, deployed to production. In production, our app is monitored by Apache Skywalking, which is the um, APM that Sor uh, SourceMarker is built on, and as, as well as Source++. But um, anyways, Skywalking then provides that feedback and shows that our code has negatively affected production's performance. So I wrote some code, some bad code has um, negatively affected production. And now the, uh, Skywalking has picked up on this and is showing um, dashboards that show that the state of, our, the state of production has gone down. Uh, finally, someone is going to pick up that um, monitoring and they're going to provide us that feedback and eventually it comes back to us and we can uh, correct our code and then finally push out the fix. So this is what a typical process of discovering production bugs might look like. SourceMarker as an IDE plugin allows us to simply remove that last step. Instead of piping and instead of uh, having somebody communicate feedback to us, we can instead pipe that feedback directly back to ourselves. So this is exactly what we need for non-breaking breakpoints. So now I wanted SourceMarker to be like a standalone project. So I tried experimenting with some different um, things that could uh, feedback or pipe back from production to um, a developers IDE. And these are some of the ideas that I kind of came up with. Um, one of the ideas was like tracking the activity, activity of particular methods. So here I have like a request map, uh, request mapping for my users. And you can kind of see um, the average response time of that. Or like being able to navigate distributed traces so Skywalking is very known, is well known for its tracing. And I wanted a way to be able to navigate the tracing that Skywalking had, but I wanted to do it in my IDE, not in um, some dashboard. I wanted to hook up with the source code, you know? And then obviously pip piping logging back to the code, because why would you want to check some uh, website for your logs when you could just go to the place that the logs came from and just click that and up comes the logs. Seems much more um, convenient. And then, of course, the alerting system that uh, Skywalking has. So if there is exceptions, uh, checked exceptions, stuff like that that happens in production, it's very easy just to simply add little um, icons and, and other stuff to the source code that shows when the last time this kind of exception happened in production. So well, I thought those were all pretty cool ideas, but uh, the mission at hand was the live debugging. So with the implementation of Skywalking and SourceMarker, we now have this means of piping immediate feedback back to the developer's IDE. Now, if we just solve that, that, that live instrumenting code part, well, I'm very proud to introduce um, Source++. It's a live coding platform that's built on top of Skywalking and SourceMarker. Um, this project was released open source yesterday. So if you find these ideas interesting, please give it a try, leave a star, stuff like that. 
Um, we're just getting started. So um, if you have any ideas, uh, I would love to hear them. Okay, so what is live? What is a live coding platform? What is live coding? Essentially, live coding would mean that whenever we write some code, that it would automatically trigger the deployment of that very code. So that sounds very, very scary to most, especially in production. So instead of doing that, most of the time we do these long um, bureaucratic processes that separate the deployment of code. And that makes sense for arbitrary code changes. You obviously don't want people arbitrarily deploying code to production, but we're not talking about arbitrary code changes. We're talking about adding non-breaking breakpoints. It doesn't make sense to do all this for a non-breaking breakpoint. So how do we get past all this necessary bureaucracy while keeping the security behind getting things into production, getting changes into production? The answer is to limit the scope of changes and allow a more direct path, but only for the changes that involve certain types of um, instrumenting code. After all, if we, could if we could definitively determine that this change is a non-breaking breakpoint, we could know that this change is not gonna change production, so we could safely send it to production and not have to worry or whether or not it's going to break it. If we could do that, then all we would need to do is to ensure that this developer has the appropriate code level access, be it a certain class, method, variable, or value. So this is where we could fine tune the internal access and we, we won't have to sacrifice whether, whether or not our um, production is completely open or completely closed. We could fine tune the internal access of production. If we wanna make it so developers can't, see, can't use non-breaking breakpoints to view passwords in production, then we could easily do that. So this direct path is exactly what you get when you combine the source plus plus source marker and skywalking uh, technologies. How these technologies fit together to facilitate live coding is pretty straightforward and it pretty, it pretty closely resembles the normal installation of skywalking. The primary difference is that now instead of data coming from production, we've also got a little bit of data going to production. And this happens whenever developers create those non-breaking breakpoints. So as developers send in those requests, they're authenticated these non-breaking breakpoints, sorry, sorry. Um, these non-breaking breakpoints are sent to the feedback controller, and then they're prepared to sent, prepare, pre prepared to be sent to production. These requests are sent, and then they're inter they're intercepted by the Source Plus Plus probe, which is a, a bundled um, technology that comes with um, Skywalking. The probe makes it the probe is necessary because uh, it makes runtime modifications to the live application, and then pipes this data back into Skywalking's tracing system. And then normal skywalking after this part pretty much takes over. Um, these traces are then sent to the skywalking collectors where, the, where uh, Source++ has some feedback processors that are designed for capturing non-breaking breakpoints. Those uh, processors then process the non-breaking breakpoints, they save them to the storage. And then finally, we uh, redact some personal information, uh, credit cards, variables. This is where all the internal access that we've set up for um, developers um, like the administrative stuff, so they can't see passwords, so they can't see credit cards, stuff like that. And then with that architecture, we now have a continuous ability for creating non-breaking breakpoints in production, or as I like to call them, live breakpoints. I like to call them live breakpoints. They work through simple runtime bytecode modifications that insert code for Skywalking's manual tracing API. So for breakpoints, this is as simple as creating a conditional that once, will, that once executed will open a local span save the currently accessible variables to that span, and then close the span. That's it. That's the only change that occurs when developers add live breakpoints to production. Currently, Source++ only works with JetBrains base IDs, so I'll demonstrate what a live breakpoint looks like for a developer with IntelliJ. If you're familiar with how regular breakpoints work, you'll be aware that normally this is done through clicking the gutter near the line of the code you want to interrupt on. Live breakpoints work exactly the same way. Now, we could add our non-breaking break. We could add our non-breaking breakpoint this way, or a live breakpoint this way, and that would be fine. But I'll introduce a different way, a new way, a better way. I like to call it the live coding way. So instead of using our mouse, we're going to use something called a live control bar. So we type in Control Shift S, and up pops the live control bar, where my, my where my carrot previous was. So while this uh, structure is unobtrusive, this live control bar actually holds a lot of power and gives us the ability and gives us the ability to debug production with with rel relative ease. It's completely hidden when we don't need it, and when we do need it, we're able to uh, see all the jam-packed functionality it has. Sorry, I, transition was bad, but um, it's packed with functionality. Uh, functionality that's filtered and configured for the exact scope of the source code we're in. This means we can type a command as simple as add live breakpoint and it knows exactly what we don't want to do. Add a live breakpoint to line 60. So let's hit enter. 
And just like, and just like a regular breakpoint, we can add condition for what triggers the live breakpoint. Since this method we're in currently involves duplicating to-dos, let's add a breakpoint that'll, email, that'll trigger only if the to-dos title contains the word email. So just like regular breakpoints, we can reference variables and getter methods. And then we can turn that into a Boolean operation for the live breakpoints condition. Looks good, let's hit enter. And we will keep the default limit of one since we only want one live breakpoint to trigger. Let's hit enter again. Our request is sent for installation. And just like that, our live breakpoint is installed in production and ready to go. Now we just need someone to trigger it. So let's imagine we waited a bit and then, boom, someone does something in production that fulfills the condition of our live breakpoint. We can view all the hits we've collected. And if we select one we have, we can see all the variables available at that context at the time the breakpoint was triggered, just like we could with a normal lo local breakpoint. So now I know I've hyped up uh, non-breaking breakpoints a lot for this talk, but one thing you quickly realize when you've implemented something like live breakpoints is that you could do the same thing with logs. Just like breakpoints, logging doesn't change logic. It exposes internal state. If we could update our logs in production, we could practice just-in-time logging. That's exactly what live logs do. Under the hood, they even work the same as non-breaking breakpoints, except now we're using Skywalking's manual logging API. Now, instead of opening and closing local spans and tagging variables, we're just creating and sending log data. So let's bring up the live control bar again. This time, let's in, this time in the add to do method. And instead of a live breakpoint, let's add a live log. And let's input something that we want logged. Let's say we just want to output the title of the to-do. So we type in our log message, added new to-do with title, and then we call the get title method on the to-do object. And let's hit enter. Our request is validated. And again, instantly installed into production, ready to go, just waiting to be triggered. Eventually, people start adding to-dos, and the logs start coming through. And we can see the feed of all the messages that were logged in production. And since it's a live log, we can update this as, much, as many times as we please. So it's um, totally dynamic. And if, if all that wasn't cool enough, I have one more live instrument I want to show today. Um, they're my current favorite, but the least developed instrument. So be wary. And that's the live metrics. So I personally like these because they allow for a new breed of developer native KPI monitoring. Live breakpoints and live logs might be useful for production debugging, but it's only live metrics that allow us to create useful reports and visualizations from production feedback. And of course, live metrics work the same as all the others. Um, we, this time we're using the Skywalking's manual meter API. And in this case, we're using counters. So we just increment by one every time the counter triggers, very simple. Let's bring up the live control bar again. Now you can kind of see why the uh, live control bar is so useful. If all these different live instruments had to be implemented throughout the um, IDE, there'd be so many different spots you go to to find them, et cetera, et cetera. But now we just have one place, one command, and uh, we can do it anywhere we want to. So let's add something called a daily counter metric. This is the same thing as a drop wizard or, or an open tele telemetry counter, but uh, we're using the Skywalking API and instead of resetting and we're, and, re and we're resetting the counter every day. So uh, let's hit enter. And then let's leave a note for this counter. Let's say that this tracks uh, the amount of created to-dos per day, since that's what we want to track. And we're in the add to-do method. And let's hit enter. And since we want to know all the to-dos created per day, we're going to leave the condition blank, since we want all to-dos. Let's hit enter again. The request is validated. And up comes, it, and up comes this little gutter mark, which if we hover our mouse over, we can get a live tracking of that counter. So obviously these um, screenshots are fabricated, but the idea would be that um, you could see as this updates, um, you could hover over it and you can see live counts, et cetera, et cetera. So it seems very simple, but if you think about the amount of work necessary to add custom metrics to source code, you'll quickly see that you've got a lot of work to do. And that's not even including the instant and real-time functionality that you can do with live metrics. You can add these anywhere at any time. So my hope for the future of live metrics is that we can merge these with Apache Superset. If you are familiar with Apache Superset and you're good at that stuff, 
feel free to reach out. Um, I need some help with um, with Apache Superset. Anyways, um, I won't touch you with any more slides. That's all I have. Um, I hope you found my talk interesting. Um, as you can see, I think uh, the future of live software development is bright. Um, I think there are a lot of um, live coding things we could do and a lot of live coding things that would be very nice to um, have. So if you like that kind of technology too, please give Source++ Plus Plus a try. It's missing a few features, but it will evolve quickly, um, especially with your input. Um, with that being said, I'd be happy to answer any questions and thanks for listening, everyone.